It's a beautiful day. Thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm Kumar Sinaya. I'm a professor in chem of chemistry in our chemistry and biochemistry department. So it's my privilege today to introduce Dr. Kim Arthur. And uh, she's going to talk about her time from Calvin all the way to where she is now. She graduated from Calvin College in 1982 with, a, with degrees in chemistry and biology, or I would say biology and chemistry. And then from Calvin, she went to the University of Chicago for her medical school degree. And from Chicago, she went to UCLA, where she was there for a long time, nine years, uh, doing her postgraduate work. And then she started her first faculty position at UCLA, and then moved in 95 to the University of Pennsylvania, where she has been there 20 years. <laughs> Uh, and she's uh, currently the Donald Guthrie Professor of Surgery, and uh, she's also the Chief of the Liver Transplant uh, Division. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Porter. So this is from Michigan to Philly and places in between, and the places in between are Chicago, that's the Michigan on the far left, and Philly on the, the far right, and then that's Chicago Millennial Park. It wasn't like that when I was there uh, back in the 80s. And then LA with its uh, lovely uh, smoggy sunsets, which is the way it was when I, I was there. And I hope as I go through some of the, my experiences, you'll see some common themes, and one is, um, serendipity, you're never quite sure what was going to happen to you next, and also the ability to take advantage of opportunities that come your way. Um, the importance of mentorship and role models and how it affects what you do for the rest of your life, as well as um, the critical nature of teamwork and how family plays a role in everything <coughs> that you do. So I hope you'll see that as we go forward. So I'm going to start a little before Calvin. I uh, grew up in Detroit. I was born in Chicago, or the suburbs of, and I don't remember that much because we moved when I was two, but I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit, um, middle of two of three kids. I had an older brother and a younger brother. Um, my dad went to Calvin, and my older brother went to Calvin, so I just had to go to Calvin, too. Um, <laughs> my mom was a nurse. Um, dad worked for General Motors his whole life. It was a different GM building when, when we lived in Detroit. Now they're in the Renaissance Center, I guess. I re have memories of Detroit. I remember the riots in 67. I remember when the Tigers won the World Series in 68. And then on the, on the right, on the bottom, that's my high school. I went to Birmingham Seahome High School, which was a huge public high school. But I think the things I did there also shaped what I was going to do. That is field day, and that's a big event that happened every fall in the all, each class fought against each other with source, supposedly creativity. 
and that was our banner. We were Sherlock Holmes that year, and I designed and painted that banner, and we won that year, so I was proud of that. But that <laughs> foreshadowed a little bit, I think, of some of the things that I, I did at Calvin as well. So I went to Calvin. I was at Beats Beanstra my first year. My roommates were Cassie and Susan and Jackie. Cassie was in the swim team, and she just decided uh, you should come to the swim team as well. And the coach then was, was Nancy Meyer. And one thing I learned was if you're going to succeed in life, half of succeeding is just showing up. Because I was not a very good swimmer. Um, but I came to practice twice a day. And I, for every because you came to practice, you could swim in all the meets. And it was a really great experience for me to be part of a college uh, athletic team. The other thing I joined was thespians, and James Cork was directing thespians at that time. And I learned from thespians that complex things, like a play, have all these different moving parts. There's not just the people on stage, but there's the backstage, and there's the sets, and there's the orchestra, and the music, and all that sort of thing. And it takes a whole lot of direction and coordination to bring something like that so complicated together to make one beautiful thing at the end. And it's not unlike surgery. Um, and I think that's something that I did the, I was involved in that in high school and also at Calvin. Professor Bauma was one of my biology teachers that had a lot of influence on me and I have a lot of great memories of him. And then Professor Tegelar here, <laughs> a little older perhaps than when I knew him, but he was my pre-med advisor, playing with a brain it looks like, I think. I didn't go into neurosciences, but uh, he did influence um, my life and my career for a long time, uh, for many years, and, uh, and have stayed in touch for all these years as well. And one other person that uh, affected me at Calvin, besides many others, is Robin Jensen. This is a self-portrait I found on the internet, um, and I'll sh you'll see the way he affected my life on the next slide. I remember things like organic chemistry being one of the hardest classes, but the most uh, enjoyable, and also religion with Professor Holtrup, which was really, really tough, but I also learned a lot. So at Calvin, I swam, and I was in thespians, mostly behind the scenes, not here on the stage, although I had occasionally a few parts here and there, but I like working on the sets and doing the stage managing. But one of the most, I think, life-changing things I had at Calvin was going, the interim, is it, do you still have interim? <laughs> so interim was great. One class, one week, <coughs> right? So I signed up for pedaling and pondering with photography, which was all of January, where we rode our bike from one coast to the other. So we started in uh, San Diego and finished in St. Augustine, and we did that in the month of uh, January. There were 30-some kids. Robin Jensen was the one who led that, and we all had to have a theme and take photographs. My theme was food. <laughs> <laughs> really great. So I got to photograph food across southern United, you know, the southern part of the United States. But the more important thing that happened is I met my future husband on this bicycle trip, David Van Actually, three marriages came out of that trip. <laughs> 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 engagement picture. We both have that windblown hair. <laughs> <laughs> it was right by Sempon. That was her. That was her. <laughs> and I did eventually graduate. So there's my mom and dad. And they're sitting in the background now. I can't, you know, make too many stories up because they'll call me on that. I'm not true to form. So from Calvin then, um, we went to Chicago. Now, um, David, otherwise known as Bing to the rest of us because his high school buddies called him Bing and when his college roommate went as, because of Dave Bing on the Detroit Pistons, you're all too young for that, but uh, <laughs> one of his roommates in Calvin heard his buddy from high school calling him Bing and that stuck. So he was Bing for the rest of our lives and I think I've always called him Bing, my family calls him Bing and I don't think my family even knew his real name <laughs> until you have the wedding invitations made. <laughs> We went to Chicago, and there's a story how we got to Chicago. He was going to go to seminary, and then he met me, so I messed that up. Um, he didn't go to Calvin Seminary, but he did want to study um, religion. And so when, when I decided I wanted to go to medical school, and he was going to go look at divinity school. So we looked all around the country where there was a good divinity school and a good medical school. Now, Calvin is known everywhere 
um, for their divinity school. So he was getting offers from Yale and Harvard and Princeton and University of Chicago and all that sort of thing. And I was trying desperately to get into these medical schools and uh, not having as much luck as he was. But I was fortunate enough to get waitlisted at University of Chicago. And I think there's a little bit of history between Professor Tigelar and the dean at um, UC that might have helped a little bit, perhaps a little. Um, anyway, we ended up at University of Chicago. The Div School there is incredibly well known, a lot for its coffee shop. They say it's where God drinks coffee. And uh, so I went to the med school there. My husband was very much involved with UCTC, which is the track club there. He ran track and cross country here at Calvin. And we, we really loved our four years there. And this is where I want to start talking about a little bit more about the mentors and the people that affect your life. I, is, I was going to go to med school. I always wanted to be a surgeon. But I thought, I'm just going gonna, gonna to go. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be a general surgeon. I'll go you know, back to Michigan, probably be a community general surgeon, which is great. But then you go to a place like University of Chicago, which is um, where they show you that like, you can't just do that. You have to do the science part and the research and the academics as well. This is Dean Seidhamel. He was the dean of the medical school there when I came. And he was very, very personable and interacted with every student and really tried to get the greatest potential out of every student that was there. There were other people that I interacted with that affected, um, that are related to the, what I do now. This is Mark Siegler. He was professor of ethics. Um, and he, we did medical ethics class. And he had the most interesting medical ethics class. And he was actually one of the first people involved in the ethics of living donation when they did the first living donor at University of Chicago, living donor liver transplant there. <coughs> Another person who was there was Arthur Rubenstein. He was chair of medicine. He was an endocrinologist. But he ended up being my dean at Penn. He eventually came back to Penn, and we became very good friends. He just recently retired a couple of years ago. There's a surgeon, Christoph Grolsch. Um, he came from Germany, and he started doing liver transplants at University of Chicago. So I got to rotate on his service and see what a liver transplant was like. I wasn't thinking about doing transplant surgery then, but it certainly was interesting, and I think stayed in the, in the back of my mind. But I think the person who influenced me the most at Chicago was a surgeon called George Block, named George Block, Professor Block. And he was, he was a typical, you know, good old boy surgeon. And you were scared to death when you rounded with them. You had to know the answer. There was a thing called block rounds where he'd sit in a room like this and he'd point at you and you better know the answer. And, and he usually didn't point to the students, but every once in a while he did if he got to know you and you had to know the answer. But he was straightforward and he took an interest in the <coughs> students and he really influenced uh, me as far as you know, making me realize uh, my potential and what you could do. And I think he did that with every uh, student that he interacted with. Um, another person I don't have a picture of and I didn't show is uh, Professor Gottlieb in, in plastic surgery. And he was someone I did research with. And that was something I learned at, at U of C. And that was that you can combine the clinical work with the research work and make it all very, very interesting and collaborative and, and work together. Um, so I actually decided when I was a medical student that I wanted to be a plastic surgeon. I wanted to do reconstructive burn surgery. That was my goal. And so when I started looking at residencies, I was looking at residencies where they had a very good plastic surgery program. And back then, you'd do five years of general surgery, and then you'd do a two-year plastic surgery fellowship after that. So I was looking at the general surgery programs. And I had you know, some of the programs in my mind of where I wanted to go. And um, George Block, one was Hopkins. And then I looked at California programs. I looked at Michigan, a lot of different ones. And I remember Hopkins was sort of on my top of my list. And Dr. Block called me in my office, and uh, called me into his office and said, you know, there's two of you, there were uh, you know, a handful of us who were going into surgery. And he said, there's two, two of you want to go to Hopkins for residency. And he said, there's no way they'll take two students from University of Chicago into that residency program. And he said, particularly a woman. And you know, I, I sort of like, oh, OK. And I realized then that you know, maybe you know, before that, I didn't really think about any gender differences and, and things like that. But that really struck me. But I also thought, well, that's, I'm glad he told me that. I'm glad he was straightforward and honest and told me that. So I ended up um, 
ranking my programs differently. And I ended up matching at UCLA because he told me um, that was a great place to train and he was absolutely right. So I ended up going then from Chicago to UCLA. So we went from cold, windy city to Los Angeles. Now, the UCLA campus is beautiful. <coughs> was, I, I interviewed there in January. You know, it was great. <laughs> so it was not hard to move there. This is the, like these, the smoggy sunsets. But we happened to, with the help of my parents, found a nice place uh, a half mile from the beach. Um, so we lived in Santa Monica for nine years, which was <coughs> great. And we got to experience the Santa Monica market. And um, I ended up, for the most part, uh, being in the hospital most of the time. Back then it was every other night in-house call, and you uh, didn't go home very much. I bought, and I didn't buy, I found a cat for Bing to keep him company. And <laughs> Beza, if any of you know who Beza is? 16th century theologian, friend of Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> Because he named the cat, yeah. He named the cat Basil. So Basil was with us for many years while I did my residency. But it was my first couple months of residency where I was um, exposed to transplantation. And that's me inside a Learjet on the way to get a liver somewhere. And as a second, second month of my internship, I was rotated on the transplant service and my whole life plan changed. I'm not gonna, I decided I'm not doing plastic surgery. This is just way too cool. So I went on many donors, I scrubbed on and many transplants, and transplantation back then, this was in 1986, had just started, they had just started the liver transplant program in 1984. And that's when I decided I wanted to be a transplant surgeon. This is um, an old painting, but it's Cosmos and Damien. And they were both physicians in the third century AD. They were, became saints, you can see the little halos around their heads, and uh, they were known for not ever receiving payment for anything except if you had faith in Jesus. That was enough for them. And they would take care of sick people. But one of the most things they're famous for, at least in, it's known for in my world of transplantation, is they transplanted a leg of one person onto another. And they transplanted an Ethiopian leg onto this uh, white person's leg. You can see the dark leg on the white man. That's the one thing they were known for. Uh, in legend has it. I don't think the light lasted very long. But we have our modern day Cosmos and Damien that were my, you know, sort of heroes back then. And this is Tom Starzl, who's known as the father of liver transplantation and, and started liver transplantation first at Denver and then he moved to Pittsburgh. Um, and Sir Roy Kong, who was doing the same thing on the other side of the Atlantic uh, in the UK. Um, Starzl wrote this book, Memoirs of a Transplant Surgeon. If you haven't read it, it's really an interesting read to, to hear how transplantation started. And Sir Roy Cohn was an artist, and he loved painting pictures of, of transplants and organs <coughs> and things like that. And they actually both received the Lasker Prize together, and many people who received the Lasker Prize go on to receive the Nobel Prize, and I imagine that, that they might get that someday. Well, I had my own Cosmos and Damien at UCLA that were my mentors. One is Ron Busatel, who's now chair of surgery at UCLA, but he started the transplant program there. And uh, that's him in the OR with a, with a liver. That's a liver. Um, he was just as comfortable uh, behind the wheel of a Ferrari as he was uh, in the operating room. And he was known for his, the cars that he raced and also collected. And then my, another surgeon at UCLA who was there when I trained and then also recruited me to go with him to Penn is Avi Shaked. And he is a great surgeon as well. And I learned a lot from him, not just surgery, but the art and science of surgery and how you can combine doing science as well as surgery uh, and be successful uh, clinically. And he was just as comfortable on the top of a mountain as he is in the operating room. He likes to trek and climb mountains. So that was uh, UC UCLA, and we stayed there for nine years. I did five years of general surgery, two years in the lab doing research, um, looking at things like TGF-beta and stuff like that. And then um, it was time to find a job. And the, the decision between where you go for a job is an important one. Um, and we had to decide uh, after fellowship where to go. Now, there were a couple things that influenced that. 
One, we had a son, and this was, uh, you know, people always ask, when's a good time to have a kid during a residency? There's no good time and you can't plan it. So I had the absolute worst timing for when I had uh, kids, but it didn't make any difference because it's it all worked out great. But I had, we had Lucas when I was a chief resident. Don't even ask me how I managed to do that. But I was a chief resident and Lucas was born, and this is us going back to Univers University of Chicago after being finally finished his thesis so that he could graduate, and, and that's, uh, that was in 1993. And they, uh, we made decisions about children and what I was going to do, and I, you know, I was told them to give this talk that I should talk about some of the decision-making processes, and one of the big decisions that we had to make was um, with a job like a transplant surgeon, you know, how are you going to have a family and, and balance all that? And we talked a lot before we had kids about how we were going to do that. And I was very fortunate in the fact and is that Bing is much more the patient one between the two of us, but also was very, very willing to be um, <coughs> someone to stay at home with the kids. And back then in the you know, early 90s, not too many guys were doing that. And, I, and it, you know, he didn't have a big ego to deal with. He was very happy with doing that. And he was great with that. And he's, he's become the best friend of both our boys. And uh, this is me now. I told you about bad timing for pregnancies. <laughs> so I, Lucas was born when I was a chief resident. And then I was a second year fellow getting ready to move to Philadelphia. And as I find out I'm pregnant again. So this is right before finishing. This is me and the four other fellows that were there at UCLA. We took a picture for Ron Busatil in front of this Ferrari we found and gave it to him. But that's me, seven months pregnant before moving to uh, to Philadelphia to start a new job. Now you're not supposed to start, they tell you, you know, psychologists tell you you're not supposed to start a new job, have a new house, have another child, and all the, and move, and all those sort of things all at the same time, and that's what uh, I decided to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all turned out okay. So I, you know, I had a choice of just staying in LA or going to uh, Philadelphia. Those are my two solid job offers that looked good to me, and the decision to go to Philadelphia was, was a good one. In LA, I would have been a very, very busy clinical surgeon, but I don't think I would have had the time uh, or the ability or the mentorship to do the science and the research that I wanted to do as well. And so that was a main reason for going to Philadelphia, plus Los Angeles was, was great, but it really wasn't like the Midwest that we had grown up in, um, and it's great to go back and visit, uh, and we loved it there. But we wanted to see another part of the country and see and move to a part of the country that was a little bit more um, the way we wanted uh, to, we're in a place that we wanted to raise our kids. So we ended up moving to Philadelphia in 1995. Jacob was born a month later. <laughs> um, and I didn't stay home very long, not a very long maternity leave on that one. Um, uh, uh, but uh, we ended up. I ended up going to work right away. We got very busy right away with the liver transplant program. We ended up buying a house, seeing what snow was like again. Um, and then, and Bing had the ability to get a big garden and something we didn't have when we had our little tiny uh, condo in Los Angeles. So uh, we've been in Philadelphia now for 20 years and the boys are all grown now. Um, but like I mentioned, it's how you know, the ability to mix both the clinical part and the, the research part, which is really what was um, uh, something that I really wanted to do. And then here comes the serendipity part and the timing and the opportunity of things. When I moved to Philadelphia, we had done some living donor transplants in children. So the liver is made up of segments, which allows you to take a little segment or part of the liver it has its own blood supply and bile ducts and things like that. Take it out and transplant it into someone else and have all the connections you need for inflow and outflow and bile drainage and all that sort of thing. It's really the only organ you can do that with. Uh, the lung a little bit, but that's a lot, it's a lot different. So we have done some of those at LA. We had done some parent to, to babies where you take a small segment where you, I think I can use an arrow here, these, this little segment here, segments two and three, and put that into a baby. Well, in the mid to late 90s, right after um, I had, we had moved to Philadelphia, 
people started doing adult to adult living donors. Uh, Christoph Brolsch did, I, I mentioned him earlier at UFC, he did the first um, adult to baby living donor transplant. But then a good friend of mine, Egal Khan, he's a good friend now, I didn't know him back then, who was in Denver, did the first adult to adult <coughs> living donor liver transplantation. And what that was was taking this whole right lobe, which amounts to about 60 or 65% of the liver, taking that out of a young, healthy person and putting it into someone who's um, suffering from end stage liver disease. So this was sort of a game changer. But the problem with putting half a liver into somebody and taking out more than half from the donors, the liver has to grow, it has to regenerate, and people have to you know, be able to survive while all that is happening. So there was a <coughs> scientist at Penn, her name is Rebecca Taub, and she's internationally known for her research in liver regeneration. And Avi Shaked, who was the person who recruited me to Penn, is very good at being very um, persuasive at uh, you know saying you should do this. And he met Becky and said, you know, we're doing these living donors. No one's really looking at liver regeneration in the transplant model. Becky Taub's doing all this great basic science and, and the molecular mechanisms of liver regeneration. You should really talk to her and, and see what you can do. Well, Becky was great. She gave me a bench. She gave me a project. She actually you know, gave me some mice to play with. And I started doing research in liver regeneration. And nobody really was doing that. Um, there was one other gentleman in Zurich who was doing it, but not very many. So I immediately found a niche that no one else really had. And it also went hand in hand with what I was doing clinically on a day-to-day -day basis. So that you could do the, the science and the research on the basic science level and also see it happening on a clinical level. So you'd ask a clinical question and go back to the bench and try to answer that question, and find your answers and bring it back to the clinic. So that's what those, that's the pathway my research took and it just happened to be that that was what happened and these living donors were just starting to take off uh, in the United States at that time and I got to be involved in some of the basic research and it's, it's evolved into, this is uh, Prometheus Bound, it's a great painting that's in the, the pen our museum, um, and if you know the story of Prometheus, the, the eagle, he stole, he stole fires from the gods and gave it to mankind, and the gods got angry, so therefore they chained him to a rock, and every day an eagle would come and eat out his liver, and every night it would grow back, and so the, the Greeks and the Romans knew something that we didn't know, that the liver does regenerate. But it was the how it regenerates and whether we can make it regenerate better or see what we can do to enhance regeneration. That's what my research has focused on. And it started with, with mouse models and trying to look at simple things that made regeneration bigger or less, less strong, looking at things like IL-6 and other cytokines. And now my work is focused more translational. This is um, a gene array for those, and many of you probably have seen these already. And we're looking at the the genomics of liver regeneration and what makes a liver regen, which, what's the gene expression uh, signature of livers that regenerate well compared to those that, that don't regenerate as well. And a lot of this has been within a multi-center NIH consortium that we've been a part of for the last 15 years, which has been a really exciting part of what I do um, on the research side of things. On the clinical side of things, I think what I've learned the most and what's the most important to me <coughs> is that transplantation is a team sport. Now these are all pictures from the operating room, but you don't know what goes into getting someone to this stage. It's, um, it's a specialty where it's not just the surgeons doing the procedure. It's a specialty where you have to have all sorts of specialists and um, physicians and non-physicians and social workers and pharmacists and um, hepatologists and infectious disease specialists and cardiologists, all these people have to help get these patients ready and help them while they wait on the list so that they can actually make it to the stage where we're actually doing a liver transplant. Um, so this is a liver transplant, this is a liver transplant, this is actually something we're transplant now is, this is a bilateral hand transplant. So remember Cosmos and Damien? Well, we're now, we're doing hand transplants. We've done a couple of them now, one in an adult and one in a child. Not that I do that, 
but I, it's coming back to my roots where I wanted to be a plastic and reconstructive surgery. So those are all my friends who are plastic and reconstructive hand surgeons doing these bilateral hand transplants and, and working collaboratively with the transplant team. So now I want to transition a little. I was asked uh, to talk about what are the front burner issues that I'm dealing with. Well, every day is a front burner issue, it seems like sometimes with the patients that we have and how sick they are. But there are a couple things that really um, take up a lot of my uh, effort and time because I want to help make a change and make things better um, over the course of whatever remains uh, in the years of my career. And most of it is because of this graph. I showed it in the, in the ethics course this morning, but this top line is how many people are on the waiting list in the United States. This bottom bar is how many transplants we do. And it's flat. There's still 12, over 12,000 people waiting for a liver transplant, and we still only do about six to 7,000 liver transplants a year. And somehow, it would be nice to narrow that gap in some way. And if you see it in, the different, in another country, it's even, the gap is even bigger. And here, over 2,000 people die on the wait list every year. So what is it that we can do uh, to make that better and make that different? <coughs> One of the things um, that I focused on in this morning's class, and I, I'm not going to talk about it much now, is how there's disparities in how you get a liver. Where you live makes a difference. Um, and that's not right. And so part of the work I've done on the national level and some of in these, uh, what's with UNOS, which is the United Network of Organ Sharing, or the, the organization that uh, oversees all of organ allocation, is to look at different methods and models and pathways that we can utilize to make um, liver and other organs allocation more fair and decrease disparities um, across the country. Um, and every little change you make has a ripple effect. And it's hard, you know, so it's hard, you do all this modeling to try to see if you make this one change, how will it affect the rest of the people on the waiting list? Because it's a zero sum game. There's only so many organs, right? So you have to um, be able to figure out who should get the organ and what is the best utilization of that organ. Unless we can, you know, markedly increase uh, organ donation. And that's what we try to do with living donation but that's really a very, very small number of, the, of what we do in liver transplants, which is very different from kidney transplants, where it's about half of the transplants. You can see this is the deceased organ donation. So the United States is actually one of the best countries for organ donation, as is Spain and Norway and others. They do a great job of it, but it's still not enough. What's interesting to me is this part of the world, and I become more and more interested in that part of the world as I visited it, uh, as well as trained people <coughs> that have come to our institution uh, to go back there and do transplants. If you look at the population in this part of the world compared to the, the area, it's, it's way out of proportion. I mean, there's so many, many more people that need transplants there and are, are unable to get it. So part of what um, I would like to do is help uh, train people to go back to where they come from and to make a difference in the country where they come from. These are a lot of the organizations that I've become involved with over the last 20 years since I've been in this field. Um, they're uh, either transplant associations or government associate uh, organizations that, that <coughs> determine policy on how organs are allocated or determine or help uh, train people to go uh, back to their countries or bring people here to train them or take us to the other countries to help start programs. Um, and they're all very important organizations and it's a way, I think, to help uh, make a change and make a difference in transplantation uh, in this world. Um, going to uh, D.C. is a scary thing and then you realize how complex it is to get a change made uh, on uh, on a national level where, it, where you have to make a uh, difference in, in how policy and law, um, you think Congress is stuck. It, it really is stuck and it's very <laughs> difficult to do. We, When I was um, 
president of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. We we've, we've been trying for years to get this bill passed in Congress where you can where people who get a transplant also have their immunosuppression medications paid for longer than two years. It seems silly, right, to pay for medications for two years and then not be able to pay for them because then you would lose your organ, right? And it would cost the government even more to to have them get retransplanted. But somehow you can't get that through their heads. And you go year after year trying to get that changed so that people get transplanted will get their meds uh, covered. So you learn a lot about how government works and it can be frustrating but also very exhilarating. I said we train people from all over the world and also have people in our institution. So my, a lot of the people that work with me have come from all over the world. So we have a very international faculty, but we've also trained a lot of people that have come to Penn and gone back to the countries that they're from. <coughs> These stars kind of give you an idea of where we train some of the people and where they've gone back to. One thing that uh, has been a, a perk of what I do is the ability to travel and see things and learn from other parts of, of <coughs> the world. My two partners and travel friends who sort of introduced me to the uh, wonderful diversity and, and experience and opportunities in the world are my two colleagues at work, Roger Eddy, who's chief of hepatology, and Avi Shaked, who's, who's been my mentor for many, many years. But they're the ones, they're both were born in different countries. One was born in Israel, one was born in India. They both came to the United States to train, but they have a very big focus on trying to give back uh, to the rest of the world of the, of the beauty and the bounty uh, that you have here in the United States that we can also uh, give that back uh, to play to other parts of the world. So I've been all over the place and each place has always been, you know, to have a conference or to visit an institution or to try to work with a colleague either on research or on clinical projects and try to help uh, expand uh, transplantation in this world. One of the projects we're, we're really focusing on now is Myanmar, since the borders have opened. It's because it used to be Burma, now it's Myanmar, and we, uh, we went there a few years ago, I've been back a couple times now, going back in February, and we're working with the medical school there, first on issues of hepatology and vaccination for hepatitis B and things like that, but they also want to shoot high. They have really, really great people there. They want to try to start a transplant program in Myanmar. And that would be something exciting if we can help train some of those people to go back and really work and you know, have something happen in Myanmar. This was a ribbon cutting. It was kind of fun to be there for that. And we've had the people then come and do observerships and train with us. These are two of my fellows experiencing, who both are from India, one's from uh, Mumbai, and one's from southern India, be experiencing snow in Philadelphia for the first time. And Kumar came, he loved going to see the Phillies <coughs> and flying on the Lear jets to get the livers, but he went back to India and started doing deceased donor liver transplantations in India. And uh, more visitors from Argentina and from Myanmar that have come to us at Penn. We've also worked with the internet and teleconferencing and teleeducation. You know, you can't always fly back and forth to these countries, so we've, we've, uh, we've worked on, um, you know, having uh, video conferences and education via the internet, which has really uh, increased a lot of what we can do internationally as well. And this is, I want to also say that it's not just us teaching other people in other parts of the country, but them teaching us as well. Um, in <coughs> Asia, they don't have the um, brain death laws that we have, and a lot of it is cultural. They don't believe in brain death. So they don't have the deceased donor organs availability that we have. You saw that on that map I showed. So they instead have developed living donor liver transplantation and it's skyrocketed there. This is just from about 2000 on in South Korea and in Japan and in India and Hong Kong. You know, you can see the number of living donor transplants is going straight up. In the United States, it's, it's flat. But in these countries, they've learned so much and now people from the United States go to these countries to learn how to do uh, living donor liver transplants. And, and I've been to South Korea a couple times to do just that, also to give talks at conferences and to share what we know, but to learn from them. And this is 
uh, in the operating room at a South Korea University, uh, Seoul National University, and learning from them how they do living donors, learning tricks that I can then bring back to make the surgery and the operations and the outcomes that I do uh, even better. So finally, I want to talk about the importance of family. Um, this is my family and my bigger family, and uh, they've always been so supportive of what I've done, and I couldn't do what I do without their support. Um, my mom was a nurse. My dad always told me I can do whatever I want. You know, no one, there weren't very many women going into surgery, and there weren't very many women at all in transplant surgery, but, you know, no one ever put a, a block in the road to do that, and it was, it was always the support that they gave me. My sons always understood um, when I was not home, and they were lucky to have a dad that was there. And this is my, my bigger family as well, and this is my husband's family. I was always a little worried about the, what they would think about having, you know, being stay at home with the boys, because they were very, it was a very traditional family. Uh, and, you know, they were so supportive and great with the whole idea of, of him being a stay at home dad and having me. Uh, work all the time, and that just made it so much more comfortable and easy for me to be able to do what I do, so that because I knew that he also had the support of his family. And that's my kids now, they're not small anymore. Um, we got to go to Amsterdam and Holland uh, uh, last summer, so <laughs> they enjoyed seeing the windmills and going back to their uh, their roots. They had ne we had never been there before as a family, but. Uh, Without their support, without um, being, you know, being the one to be at home, to always be there for the little things, and for my kids, particularly as they grew up and knew what I did, to understand the reasons that why, you know, I leave in the middle of the night and not be home for a weekend and things like that, they, they were incredibly supportive of that as well. So, hello from Philadelphia. We were lucky to have the Pope there. I was actually in India when the Pope was there, so I missed all the excitement. But the Pope even left, left up with less a message about organ donation, so that was kind of exciting. And I heard that Grand Rapids is the beer capital of whatever, although Philly likes to take that, so that's why I put the, the picture on the left, because Ben Franklin kind of saying that beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> ben Franklin is when he started the University of Pennsylvania, so we believe everything he tells us. <laughs> so that's my story. And I think that leaves a little time for questions. Well, this is the time for questions. So I think first of all, we want students to ask questions. Yeah. We might ask you to ask. Looking back, is there anything that you would have changed or done differently? Wow, that's tough to answer. <laughs> <laughs> there are probably a lot of little things I would have done, but there is nothing I'd rather be doing in my life than what I do now. Um, you want to be, if you're going to invest so much of your life in something, you want to be passionate about it. And I think what I do, um, particularly the day-to-day -day stuff with the patients, is so rewarding um, that there's no way I would change what I do. Would I do something's different? Yeah, I would have liked to have, you know, figured out a way to make it to more of the kids' cross country meets or, you know, be home for some of the, the school meetings and things like that. But in the long run, I think there's not a whole lot of things that I would have changed. I was really happy that you can, you know, when different opportunities came along and you make a decision to go down a path, you don't want to regret that you did that. So you, you take the good and you go forward. I'm, all, I'm a glass half full kind of person rather than a glass half empty. And I don't think I, there were a whole lot, there's not a whole lot of things I would, I would have changed. Yeah. Oh, why livers? Why livers? <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, it is such a cool surgery. You have to see it. <laughs> it's the most complex surgery you can do. Transplanting a heart is easy. Transplanting a heart is easy. Judy, what would you like to say about that? 
yours was it? But you know, so it's it. But uh, it's you know, the heart's got big vessels and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of pharma, you know, a lot of hemodynamics and stuff that change. But the liver has um, this. It's uh, it's not just um, an organ. It does so much, and it's a. Uh, it's, it's the function of it as far as the sort of a factory as well as the clearinghouse and the actual surgery itself is very delicate and takes a lot of finesse. Um, and the patient, the, the things that you see, you see a patient incredibly ill in an intensive care unit, you know, not waking up and you give them a liver and just the next day they're awake. And I think that's what impressed me the most when I was a resident <coughs> and first rotated on the liver transplant service. Um, so it's incredibly complex but challenge and challenging and rewarding surgery and it has really neat uh, physiology and pathology that you can uh, work with and do research with and things like that. Um, but for a surgeon it's sort of like the ultimate surgery. It's really <laughs> uh, what were some ways you were thinking of maybe raising the amount of livers available? Um, you would talk about how there's a disparity between the amount of needed and the amount that we do. Yeah, that's hard because people have tried a lot of different ways. Um, I think we mentioned this morning in the class, I would like to see presumed consent in the United States. I'd like everybody to be presumed to be an organ donor and to opt out mm -hmm. if you could, and I think that would be, raise it a lot. I think education of both health professionals as well as just the general public can increase the amount of organ donation and increasing the trust in the medical system to be able to do that. Um, the other thing is increasing living donors, and we're working hard to do that. It'd be great if we didn't have to put healthy people through surgery, but we're <coughs> very, very successful with kidneys, and we're seeing it has a long-term benefit uh, in livers as well. Um, so if we can increase the amount of living donors in the liver population, that would be great. Now, if you guys, I saw some of your research could come up with some way that we have, uh, can do it with uh, different uh, delivery of different pharmacological agents or cell, hepatocyte delivery or things like that. And that you're the generation that's going to come with, up with the bioengineering and things like that that might be able to do that. Then you would you can put me out of business and that would be just fine. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever split a liver from a diseased donor into two patients? Because you said you don't. We do, yeah, that split liver transplantation, and that's how we actually transplant a lot of our babies. Um, if you have a young, healthy donor, um, and then we have a baby who's very sick, we'll go to where the donor hospital is, and we'll split off that little segment and put that in the baby, and the other segment we'll put in an adult. But that still doesn't account for the baby. No, there's just not enough of perfect, young, healthy uh, uh, livers to be able to do that. We tried going out and um, splitting a liver, you know, right lobe, left lobe, so two bigger segments, but with the ischemic injury and all that sort of thing, it just doesn't function as well and as nicely as a living donor does. There's a lot of problems with that, yeah. I'm um, going this quickly. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to let you monitor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering, do you see better outcomes when you get like the full liver from someone who's like brain dead or something? or? you see better outcomes when it's like a living patient that you just like take half the liver? So if you, if you don't risk adjust, if you just look at overall uh, post out transplant survival, you have better survival with living donors. The reason is, is because we transplant those people before they get too sick. Here, the way organ allocation is, is organs are allocated to the sickest first. So, and because there's so many people on the wait list and not enough livers, you have to get really sick before you get to the top of the list. So by that time you have kidney damage or you're, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen for you to get really sick to the top of the list. And you have to, re you, know, you have to realize that deceased donors are not all, you know, young 25 year old motor vehicle accident victims. A lot of what we transplant are 68 year old people who died from a stroke and have hypertension and coronary artery disease and things like that. I, we transplant those livers every day. Um, so, um, I, you know, I mentioned the, the analogy I use as we talked about this morning is there's the Cadillac livers. I can use Cadillac because it's Michigan. <laughs> Instead, in Philly, I have to say it's the Mercedes liver. But uh, here it's, you know, you have the Cadillac livers, which are those young, beautiful whole organs, or there's the ones that are, you know, that used 
a VW or something that'll get you from A to B, but it's an old beat up car, you know, uh, but we use them because we have to, you know, we have to use all the livers we possibly can. And then you're often sick and you're getting a liver that's not perfect. So a lot of things can happen after transplant. Uh, both, overall, for both, the outcomes are great. I mean, our survival <coughs> survival is about 75% overall for the liver transplantation. I think, yeah, okay. Come on. I'm just curious, what kind of recovery is involved for a living donor? Like, how long does the recovery be after the surgery is done? So do you have you ever met anybody who's had major abdominal surgery? So it's, you know, they're in the hospital about five to six days. Um, they take off from work about six weeks, and then they're fine. Yeah. They're off walking around the next day. Yeah, we don't, yeah, they do quite well. Because you have to remember, they're young and healthy people. We can't take a half a liver from someone who's older or has medical problems or things like that. We don't want to risk that donor. So we make it as safe as possible. So then how long does it take for, like depending on how big of a section you take out of the liver, how long does it take for it to regenerate then? Most of the regeneration occurs in the first seven days, actually. Wow. Believe it or not. Um, we know that from mice and we know it from humans. Um, we, when you, we scan everybody about three months after and they're all at about 75% regenerated by that time and by a year they're all about 90 to 100% regenerated. So uh, the same, same volume that they started with. Wow. No one, do you have to ask a question? Okay. Do you want Here. Hi, Jen. At those times of your life where God's providential plan for you was entirely unclear because you're looking forward and not backwards, right? For example, uh, when you were thinking about and hoping to get into medical school but you did not have any answers yet, how did you deal with that uncertainty? How did you manage that stress when you were kind of at that stage and wondering how your vocational plan would unfold? Hmm. It has me to think back a long ways. I think, um, you know, you ask for help and support from your family, your loved ones, you know, from, you get the support that God will help you find the right answer. Um, I think when we were like looking at where we were going to train and things like that, we also tried to be just realistic about it. Um, and we tried to find as many potential options as we could. They were our top choices, and then you had to have the second, third, and, and fourth choices as well, and be ready to be happy with those, and find the best uh, option that, that comes your way. Um, and try to utilize those opportunities, uh, whether it's the exact thing you wanted or not. You know, UCLA wasn't the exact thing I thought I wanted. Um, I thought I wanted it Hopkins, but then it turned out to be the right thing for me. It was the best place for me to train. We were much more open to having women surgeons. It was where I, you know, got exposed to liver transplantation, which I wouldn't have at Hopkins. And so I believe that, you know, even though it might not be the thing you want, you have to then believe that it might be the thing that was meant to be instead. I'll be another question. I was just wondering, how do you ensure that the, the patient doesn't lose excess, like too much blood? Because I'm assuming like it has to be a lot of blood, right? Or, yeah. yeah. We're so very, we're to... very, very good. Yeah. How about you? It's it's a very good question. Liver transplantation is probably the bloodiest procedure you can have, and it's a, it is because people have what's called portal hypertension. They develop all these extra blood vessels for blood to get around the liver because the liver gets all scarred down and it can't go through. So you have to dissect through all these blood vessels. And it used to be, when liver transplantation started, that recipients would get 50, 60, 70 units of blood. You know, and they'd run, you know, empty out the blood bags and things like that. And, you know, the blood bank was, oh, we got a transplant today. But, and that's what Starzl had to live throughout. You know, today I don't even know if we would have liver transplant if you had to start it today because you'd have to, you know, the hospital said it's costing too much, your survival's terrible, why are you doing this? But he was an innovator, he was a visionary, he, he just kept doing it until he got it better. So now we have a lot of little toys and stuff that we use that are instruments to cauterize and, you know, and we've learned all the techniques to get livers out without too much blood problems. The, I have a funny story for that though because when we were recruited to come to Penn, they had a liver transplant program, but it wasn't 
great, and they were they had bad outcomes, a lot of blood loss and things like that. So they recruited Avi Shaked to, to lead the liver program, and he brought me out of fellowship to come with him to help him with it. And I came. I was seven months pregnant or eight months pregnant, and I mean, I, he, I land in Philly, and he says, my husband picks me up. He said, Avi, call. There's a trans two transplants in the morning. So it's like the next day we're in doing the transplants. I walk into the operating room, and they had surrounding the operating room table these these yellow pads that were all these absorbent pads. And I walk in thinking, oh, it's so nice of them. They padded the floor for me because I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I found out that's what they did for every liver transplant because there was so much blood that would fall outside of the patient on the floor. We don't have that anymore. We're, our average uh, blood transfusion for liver transplants is four or five units for a liver So. We learn, learn through the hard way. Yeah. Have you ever failed? All the time. Yeah. Patients die. You make the wrong decision. You don't take the liver for the patient you should have, and you wait, and they don't get a liver, and they die. You make a mistake in the operating room. I failed on the research. You don't know how many grants I put in to the NIH and not got funded, and things like that. So. Failure is part of life. You, you have to deal with it, and you have to learn that it's just part of what you do. Particularly if you do a field like I do, um, liver transplantation is just, you know, people are sick, and they die, and there's not enough livers, and you, you have to believe that you are doing the best that you can, that you made the right decision at that right moment, with the right amount of information, with the information that you have. And then you have to live with the decision you make, whatever that outcome might be. So if you can give one word of advice <coughs> to students who all want to be very successful, mm -hmm. how do they deal with failure at this stage? What lessons can they learn from while they are undergraduates? First, failure is just, you're going to have failure. But what you want to learn from failure is the, the things that um, you can change so that the next time you do it, it's better and you don't have the failure. Uh, the other advice I give is, is you have to be passionate about what you do because if you're not passionate about it, one, it'll affect the rest of your life. You, you know, the people you live with won't be happy, you won't be happy, and if you fail, you won't have that energy and, and uh, you know, inner strength uh, Strive, you know, striving to go forward. So you have to have a passion for something. You have to realize that failure is there and deal with it and just move on to the next one. You know, um, get you know back on the horse, as they say, and always um, be open for for new opportunities because with every failure, you might see an opportunity where you can then make progress and make a difference um, in another in another area. What students you don't know is Dr. Althoff is our 2015 Distinguished Alumni. So let's congratulate her and thank her. <laughs>